Oh, sail. Oh, oh sail. And we always wave the great feather. Oh, ah, Feliz Madre Dia. That is, today is Mother's Day, and that's the subject. And not only Mother's Day, but also Women's Liberation and following the liberation of her womb. Uh, and at present, the national consciousness, I'll refer to it that way, is very, very focused on the established conservative authority, which is poised to infringe on woman's freedom and including her womb. So that's a lot of focus in that kind of energy, and that's kind of an aid to us. That's what we're doing here. Let me start right away. This piece is by Claudia. When the almond tree blossomed in the heart of winter, all the trees around it began to jeer. What vanity! What insolence! Do you think you can bring spring in that way? The flowers of the almond tree blushed with shame. Forgive me, my sisters, she said. I swear, I did not want to blossom, but suddenly I felt a warm springtime breeze in my heart. So that pretty much, you know, brings the subject right in. I want to start right away with my centerpiece up here. <clears throat> this is actually a photo poster print of my painting. And the painting itself is very, very large, I think about four feet by six feet, like that. <clears throat> and what the painting is, uh, it's actually an apparition to me. It's an apparition and this is Mexica. Mexica is who Mexico is named after. So here for this day, a Madre Dia, uh, this is the mother of Mexico, or Mexico. And uh, I think it's, you know, very wonderful apparition for me. I have brought together many, many things here, all pertaining to her, to woman, her, and, and all of that. And that's what I'm going to be outlining here as I go along. <clears throat> uh, I think I'll go over here to this picture right here. Considering what I started out with here, not only the woman's liberation, but the liberation of her womb. It's the, awaken the, the awakening of her secondary functions. The primary function is reproduction. The secondary function is evolution. Uh, and that's the womb's capacity to process direct knowledge so as to apprehend the senses and understandings without the previous socialized interpretations. So this is another dimension of women. And uh, it appears that modern women, or something to that effect in this country, have uh, lost touch with that or forgotten that or uh, I said, uh, have other socialized um, understandings about it. <laughs> but other cultures in the past and uh, some places in the world that still have women cultures may still have this awareness that I'm referring to. So looking at the drawing itself, uh, that's my conception of what I call her perceiving vessel. That is her uterus and its uh, capacity for perception. And that's what I'm talking about here. Um, come back here. Goddesses as a name for uh, personages in the ancient world, especially in the Mediterranean and Greece. Uh, in India, there still are goddesses called Devas. And then there's virgins, that's another name, or Mexico, Virgen. Uh, all of these personages, uh, whatever their 
function or sanctity is is not about reproduction. So there is a difference here. I think I'd like to go down here to this statue that's, that's over there. The statue is the Gon. The Gon are the people who live in Northwest Africa. Um, they said they had originally lived on the Nile River but had left there because of the intrusion of the Arabs who are patriarchal <clears throat> and have lived up here. This figure here is an ancestress. She has a, a beard that's real characteristic of this in Africa and her protruding breasts and her protruding um, umbilicus there. <clears throat> All of this points out, you know, her nourishment as an ancestress. Most interesting is that she's holding a little figure, presumably an offspring, a child, something like that. But it's not coming out of her womb. The legs of this are going under her belly and into her fingers. So she's extending her fingers around and up into this uh, emergence, except the figure is emerging there. So this is also a clue to that secondary function of the woman uh, that is not reproductive in that. Other scenes that I have here, and while we're mentioning Africa, I definitely should be here. Here's an African woman for mother from probably Nigeria. And then we can go right up here to, to this one here. Now you can see this is a, a little figure that definitely is uh, holding, cradling an infant. Uh, this is about 700 years old. This is from Thailand. Uh, so that we definitely have the mother in this sense figured here. So we can go up to this figure here that I showed uh, last week. Uh, this, you know, is a virginette, virginette, <laughs> of uh, Guadalupe. Guadalupe would be, I think, the spiritual mother of Mexico in that way. And then we go up here to this picture. Now this represents Kali, Kali Durga, in India. <clears throat> now, in India, uh, she's still very, very strong in the full feminine sense, and she is very, very much uh, referred to as mother, very exceedingly. Um, she you was know, holding the decapitated head of a man, and so forth. Uh, so Hindu women pray to her or her double Durga uh, because she has not, you know, been assigned to be a consort to male gods. She still is strongly of woman and is not of the uh, reproductive cycle in all that sense. So that's you know, very, very telling there. And if we go over here to this figure on top, <clears throat> I put this together. This feature actually I found at Pyramid Lake in Nevada. It's a piece of tufa. And Pyramid Lake is my alma mater, and there you can see definitely her belly. Then we can come down here. This is, these are Navajos uh, that have rendered from the sand paintings. This would be you know, Mother Earth. Mother Earth, and you see that she has the vegetation around her. <clears throat> and. Uh, the sand painting has an earth bar underneath of her, so that is Mother Earth. And then under her, this is Grasshopper Girl. Now she's the parthenogenic factor. She is the germinator. She is the double of changing woman. So definitely this is the parthenogenic factor. And when I say that, then I will come over here to, to the Greeks. This is my portrait of Hera. Now, Hera, Athena, um, uh, 
other uh, goddesses in there. They're all um, parthenogenic, like that. <laughs> and here, this is my portrait of her parthenogenic daughter, Hebe. And she also is called Matrika. She is the unrecognized or unrealized little mother. Now that's what we have in theme here. That aspect or secondary function of woman uh, that is not in the reproductive principle. So that's why she is here. Then while speaking of that, then we can go over here to this figure here. This is an actual Hindu icon for the cow. <clears throat> now the cow in India is extremely ancient, ancient, ancient. Um, in the Vedas, the Vedic people, uh, the cow is just about every, everything. And she still is very, very strong in India because that's a, a current icon of the cow. Uh, our word cow actually comes from India, cow. And we have other things, you know, the Buddha is called Gautama, that means he's of the cow. And the lineage, the lineage, the Gotra, means the cow pen. So, uh, pervasively in India, the cow as mother, in many ways, you know, still goes on. Uh, one incident of the patriarchy appropriating that has been in the uh, story of Shiva, where he has a white bull, and the white bull is called Nandi. But it has been also found out that Nandi is a, a male appropriation of Nadini, uh, the, the cow, who looks pretty much like that. She also has uh, some image of one of the devas, you know, on her, her cloak there. And we go up here. This is also from Mexico. <clears throat> this is a uh, piece for mother, and she has a very notable braid here, and she's holding a sow. The sow is a very ancient symbol in the woman's culture of mother. And they come over here to this figure here. This is uh, very old, thousands and thousands of years old from the Mideast in the area of Israel or Palestine around there. And it's very interesting because what it depicts is that she's made out of clay, but she's made out of all of these parts. And this symbolizes the culture of woman, symbolizes woman herself or mother, and that is that she is a unity of discrete parts. Each part is complete and full in itself in the woman's culture. And that's how all of this is brought together here. <clears throat> um, then one step aside a little bit here to see this is my painting here of changing woman. <clears throat> so uh, she's the real mother of Turtle Island, but in Navajo she is the principal mother of the Navajo. And this is my rendition of her as she embodies light. So she has crystal and so forth in that way. <clears throat> I want to read this piece here. It's a modern piece. This is uh, Rosie Castillo. She's a contemporary of Octavio Paz. So she's a modern poetess. Without any sense of needing to nuddle her, n nudge her way into the hearts of her ancestors, her sensitive woman's institution, intuition feels the generative evolving and still alive within her. This is her, her poem. In the tree's shade, seemingly weaving a garland, we plaited our songs. We had gone from each other, and behold, we are together again. Ilke, who came from the north, bringing us the cactus's red and purple flower? Ilke, who came from the east with a face aflame with summer. Entonces, then silence happened. The silence that is born of water. 
foaming. Sudden, it curdles in a looking glass. So we grow quiet. We likewise do the same as our lakes to see the sky. So we're getting the, the, the gist here of <clears throat> the secondary function, is the way I'm putting it, of woman, that she has the capacity to realize herself. A woman's culture that's really a consciousness only of woman that prevailed since, who knows, ancient, ancient times or the, the beginning of the world, whatever, <clears throat> and to revive or reconnect that. I'm saying in cultures, maybe the Dakini in India, uh, the women's cult culture there of the yogis, uh, may have that, and who knows. Africa is still you know, very, very matriarchal. And so this is the, a very particular aspect of a woman that I'm bringing out here. <clears throat> uh, the totality of the human being is an instrument of perception. The awakening of her womb's second function makes the womb the perceiving vessel that I have uh, drawn conceptually you know, over here. When it is detracted from the reproductive cycle, the premise is the acceptance that we are perceivers. Perceivers to become the vessel of perception. And that woman can transform her understanding of the sympathetic resonance to her womb. So that's what we're inferring here, is that woman can be in touch with her womb, which is a convergence of energy there, and intuitionally is what I would say, uh, have direct knowledge, have direct knowledge without going through any other agency that purports to know or control uh, that aspect of her. And uh, this knowledge, because it's only of women, it cannot be appropriated or comprehended by the knowledge of the world which is all formulated. The idea is that there is an energetic flow of the whole universe, and this energetic flow can be apprehended directly. And in the case of the eagle, here I have the eagle here. In Cherokee, the eagle, Awahari, is fem feminine. She's a, a hen there. I don't know about the other people, uh, how that they have the eagle. A lot of times it comes out sounding like the eagle's uh, male. But uh, the ego is the very quality of sentience, of feeling, of perception, and awareness, which brings together all of this feeling of her, of the woman, of the mother, of her womb, is what I'm indicating here with, with the, the ego. And so now I'm going to bring that, you know, I think I've covered everybody here. Oh no, I have one more. Here, we can look at, at this here. Uh, in ancient Mexico, what we'll call here the mother of the earth mother is Coatlicue. In the museum there in Mexico City is this huge monolithic stone statue. It's practically indescribable. It's so totally awesome. Uh, her name suggests something, she has various names, but Kwatlicki is that she has a skirt made of snakes and her head looked like, you know, two serpent heads coming together. She's very awesome. And that's the way I've put together, you know, a representative, you know, for that. <clears throat> and this is a Aztec song for Kwatlicki. Yellow flowers open their petals. It is our mother, she whose face is masked. Her beginning is the flower patio. Yellow flowers are her flower. It is our mother, she whose face is masked. 
her beginning is the flower patio. White flowers are all open their petals. It is our mother, she whose face has masked. Her beginning is the flower patio. White flowers are her flower. It is our mother, she whose face is masked. She is our mother, queen of the earth. Now, in, in that, that, that she is, oh yes, I have one more over here. Uh, we're back here to the southwest in Hopi. Uh, this is a dance board featuring uh, Corn Beetle Girl. Now, Corn Beetle Girl is the power of reproduction, of course, for the corn, for the culture of the corn. And she is also um, sound. She is also the first voice, the first sound. So uh, she definitely is a part of this whole congregation of female personages and entities for that. Uh, in, uh, in India, Garba would be womb. Hiranya Garba means, using this idea of the mask, that there's a veil, that she is uh, veiled basically a golden veil. <laughs> so there's many ways in which these cultures are saying uh, there's something of her that's hidden and that's what we have to look to to see if she will reveal herself or we can somehow see through the veil, through the, through the mask. Uh, it is the contention in this that woman's modern woman's womb is greatly agitated because of this veiling of woman's access to the knowledge in her womb. So it's left the womb, if we're speaking modernly, in remission throughout a lifetime. Now, the ego is part of this whole uh, culture, is what I'm trying to get at, <clears throat> as why it's necessary for the woman to realize her own consciousness, of her own mind, of her own senses, without the interpretations or interferences outside of her there. <clears throat> because consciousness, as we understand it, the ego grants to every living being this sentiency to, to know, to see, to feel, and so forth. But it also requires an enhancement you know, an augmentation, and that which is in our modern time we're calling <clears throat> up-leveling consciousness, higher consciousness, and that way. For that's what nourishes the ego, and the ego is our guide and our continuity in this way. So I'm saying that in a simple way, uh, our endeavors creatively, artistically, intellectually, is the enhancement of our living life experiences. And it is the enhancement of our life which nourishes the eagle. And the eagle in Cherokee is her. <laughs> so uh, that brings me to the last poem here. I think this is very telling. This just appeared yesterday. This is by uh, Nisha Atelier. Atelier. In these conditions, the impulse to love and nourish is both insufficient and absolutely necessary, she says. Grappling with powerlessness, do, do not, by Nisha. I sniff the blooming tiger lily, two tongues sprung apart from one mouth. I poison the river unintentionally. I walk on the designated path. I splice the mountain, its body and mouth gaping. 
I collect rainwater in a wheelbarrow. I line the whale's body with gifts until they rupture its stomach. I water the strawberries. Again, I fill my gas tank with dead things. Generations spun together until shiny. I feed the ducks fresh lettuce. I maneuver the dead squirrel on the road. Mark the moment when the creature becomes meat. I accept that my love is a poisonous flower routine, routinely fatal. I calculate the force of loving in each glittering death. All day on this land, in the deep forest, the electric greens and still wet mud writhe with life. The pond gurgles and whispers. Everyone here knows to shudder when they see me coming. The mangoes arrive unbruised at the grocery store. The wolves should start running.